Welcome to the ICC Nairobi podcast, where we are all about raising godly generations. We're so glad you're here, and we believe that wherever you're listening to us from, this word will bless and minister to you. Bishop Gibson has asked me to flow on from his message last Sunday, which by the the miracle of modern technology, I was able to connect with last Sunday. Uh, You might remember if you were here, fighting for each other. And what a great message that was. Uh, Not fighting each other, but fighting for each other. And Bishop Gibson has asked me to speak today on building thriving relationships. I wonder if we can say that together. Building thriving. You know, of course, relationships can be messy sometimes. They can be difficult sometimes. Occasionally, they can be volatile. They can be challenging. Because the reality is not everybody else is as perfect as we are, right? But I've come to believe this, that relationships one with another matter deeply to God. That they matter deeply to the Father. They are so deep in His heart. These are, they, how we are with one another is part of our spiritual work. When I was first saved, I just thought if my relationship with God was good, God was happy. But I've come to know that my relationships with my brothers and sisters is also profoundly important. To Almighty God. As a dad myself, we have three kids. They're, they're big now, 22, 19, and 17. And they get on well together. Uh, but it wasn't always that way. And as a dad, if my kids were fighting with each other, I hated it. It grieved me. And now my heart is overjoyed. Sometimes Esther and I come home and they are just hanging out together, laughing together, praying for each other. And as a dad, my heart is bursting with joy. And I believe our Father in heaven looks and how we are with one another. I think he must feel something of the same. Did you notice in the Ten Commandments how four of the commandments speak of our relationship with the Lord and how we should be with him? But six of them, they actually speak into our relationships one with another. These things matter deeply. The the work of the cross, I believe that Jesus was not only restoring our relationship with Almighty God, the redemptive power of the cross, which is the primary way we must understand the cross, of course. But there was a deeper work also going on because it was not only that way, it was also one with another, the redemptive work of the cross that enables us to live as God intended as brothers and sisters together. Jesus was asked, of course, which was the greatest commandment. And this was his reply in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. He replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And Mark's gospel adds the word strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. By the work of the Holy Spirit on our lives, we can truly love one another. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and I'm sure you will know the story well. It says that he created the land and the seas and the the sun and the moon and the plants and the trees and the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. And at every stage he saw what he had made and it was was good. But when we get to chapter 2 and it's almost as if the writer backs up and gives us a little insight into something in the journey of creation, which is that something along the way was deemed not good. And in chapter 2, Verse 18, we're told that it was not good for the man to be alone. Because you see, God himself is community. He is the epitome of thriving relationship, of love and unity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, where there is no discord and there is no division. And the Bible tells us that he made us in his image and likeness. In fact, the Bible says in Genesis 1:26 that God himself said, let us, can we say us? Us, plural, make man in our plural image and our likeness. Who is the us in God? It is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the order of creation, when it was just man, something was not good because there was, although there was unfettered relationship with the Lord, there was not one like unto himself, and yet we were made in the image and likeness. I believe this is a much more powerful idea than just marriage, as important as marriage and thriving marriages are to God. Actually, this is about us being created to be in community one with another. It is not good for man to be alone, but when the deal was fixed and mended. It went from good and not good to very good. 
God saw all that he had made and it was deemed very good. This is part of God's redemptive work in our lives. That we would love one another. That we would be in thriving relationships. Bishop Gibson spoke powerfully into marriage uh, last Sunday. And I, I just want to apply a little bit wider because Jesus comes and he speaks to us that his command is that we should love one another. This is the body of Christ. John 13, 34 to 35. Jesus says, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. How is that? It is lavishly, it is sacrificially, it is powerfully, it is deeply, it is unconditionally, it is irrepressibly. Oh, the love of Jesus, as I have loved you, so I command you to love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Just a little later in John 15, 12 to 13, Jesus says, my command is, is this, love one another again as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. ICC, before I go any further, I feel I need to make a confession because for the longest time, somehow, that now I cannot understand, I missed the importance of this. You see, I did not grow up in a Christian home, but uh, my, my, uh, my mom had a powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit when I was 16. She went to a church service. She, she was not uh, really expecting to encounter God. But the power of the Holy Spirit came upon her. She came home that night without any uh, door keys. I remember at 16 opening the door to my own mother and going, what on earth has happened to you? She was radiant with the glory of God. She said, I have no idea. The next day she knelt by her bed to say the Lord's Prayer, began speaking in tongues. And it was the beginning of our family getting saved. And very quickly, I became on fire for the Lord. I became passionate for God. I became zealous for the things of God. I became a man on a mission. I like to get things done. And I grabbed hold of the Great Commission to go into all the world and make disciples. And I poured my life into getting people saved and seeing them discipled all through my 20s. But somehow, I I missed the significance of the command. Yes, the commission. I believe we must be on with making disciples. Can someone say amen? But there is a commission and also there is a command. And somewhere along the line outside of my my marriage to Esther, I had no time because I was too busy on a mission seeking to get people saved and discipled for meaning relationships myself, for brotherly love. Jesus, very command to love one another. And I was at a conference in another country. And the opening speaker began to talk about the significance of loving one another, the importance to the heart of the Father that we would love one another, that we would truly live as brothers and sisters. And it was as if the Holy Spirit came right to my seat and impacted my life. And my eyes were open that something so obvious I had somehow been missing. And at the coffee break of 2,000 delegates, 1,999 went for coffee. And I stayed where I was and wept in my seat. And God did a work in my heart. In the timing of God, one week earlier back in the UK, we had begun to lead a group of 30 young adults. And I began to develop a dream while I was away. That starting with this family, not all of whom were easy to love, I might say, at the beginning. If you understand what I mean. That we could begin to try and outwork love one another what that would mean, what that would look like, that we would do everything we could to get as far as we could back in the 21st century to Acts chapter 2, where they met together in each other's homes and they broke bread and they were devoted, among other things, to the koinonia, the fellowship, and they gave as any had need and they seemed to love one another. And in that environment, the Lord added daily those who are being saved. Esther needed no persuading. I began to understand God is not only looking for an army, he is looking for a family. He is looking for an army. I thank God I'm part of the army of God. But he is also looking for a family. People are God's most precious treasure, his most prized possession. And we set off on what became the most beautiful, powerful, messy, 
gorgeous, challenging, redemptive, attractive experience of my whole Christian life up to that point. And it shaped our lives and how we seek to outwork our Christianity and how we seek to lead the church that we have the privilege of pastoring back in the UK. There's so much I could say. We learn so much in that season. But I'd like to share with us three simple thoughts of what I believe we need as brothers and sisters in Christ to build thriving relationships. Number one, we need proximity. That means no more masks. You see, we can't truly love one another if we don't truly know one another. At arm's length, I can say I love you, but if I don't know you, it's really a manner of words. To truly love you, I need to draw a little closer to know the real you. Last week, Bishop Gibson was speaking about the the one another commands of the Bible. So many one another commands, how we should be with one another. But we can only outwork those commands if we come close. It is in Christ-centered community. It is close to one another. It is in proximity. It is without masks we can truly outwork the one another commands of the Scripture. You see, if you only see my Instagram highlights, even if you were to love what you see, you don't see the real me. Because the real me is damaged goods in recovery. Maybe some others of us are too. I thank God I'm not what I used to be, but I'm not what I'm yet going to be. And when we see him, we shall be like him. But right now, I am Mephibosheth. I have a seat by the king's grace at the king's table. But if you were to look closer under the table, I'm crippled in both feet. Because the Holy Spirit is still working upon me. And we have to draw close. We see in Genesis 2.25, before the fall, that Adam and Eve were naked, the Bible says, and unashamed. But when sin comes in, did you notice how they try to hide, how they try to cover up? They hide from God and they cover themselves and some of their innocence is lost. Because what happens is when we, when we sin, shame can come into our lives and we have a tendency to hide. Maybe it's only in the UK, but what tends to happen is people don't want others to see the real them. They want them to see the presentable them. But something happens when we open up. This is part of the redemptive work of Christ in our lives. To be clear, I'm not advocating a return to being unclothed. Thank God. Someone say, thank God. But true, thriving, strong, loving Christian relationships with brothers and sisters are real and not pretend. Of course, it's unlikely to be appropriate to share all things with all people. But there must be some people with whom we can share all things, or at least one person with whom we can share all things. And then we have truly entered into what it means to love one another. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian and pastor, who died age 39 in a Nazi concentration camp, he said, in confession, the breakthrough to community takes place. If a Christian is in the fellowship of confession with a brother or for sisters with a sister, he will never be alone again anywhere. In Acts chapter 2, I I figure the disciples, they knew one another. They had been living together for three years. They knew each other, the good, the bad, and the ugly, but they loved one another. And in their community where they broke bread in homes and They served one another and sought to outlive the command to love one another. Something incredible happened. We have discovered that if we try and outwork the command to love one another, and we dare to venture into proximity, we dare to become vulnerable with some others, far from people not loving us because of what they see, they're not surprised by what they see, and they love us all the more because we actually trusted them and came into meaningful relationships. If we fail to do that, we could be living in what the writer Scott Peck calls pseudo-community or sham community. He says this, its hallmark is the avoidance of conflict. In pseudo-community, we keep things safe. We speak in generalities. We say things that those around us will agree with. We tell little white lies to make sure no one's feelings get hurt. No one gets tense. We keep relationships pleasant and well-oiled. Conversations are carefully filtered to make sure no one gets offended. If we feel hurt or irritated, we are careful to hide it. Pseudo-community is agreeable and polite and gentle. 
and also stagnant and ultimately fatal. Marriages can last for decades, sometimes for a lifetime, and look quite pleasant from the outside. Not much conflict, not many storms. But the reality is that the husband and wife are living in pseudo-community. They talk about the kids or the job or the mortgage, but it doesn't go beneath the surface. Maybe they haven't told the truth in years about their loneliness or hurt or anger. Their sexual desires and frustrations go unnamed. They're disappointed in their marriage and each other, but neither has the guts to speak frankly and honestly. So every day they die a little more. To build truly thriving relationships, we have to let people in. I know it's difficult. I know it feels dangerous. But there is something beautiful and powerful about vulnerability. And a work of grace can happen there. Maybe we tried it some time ago and got hurt. Brothers and sisters, let's try again. Secondly, I'd like to suggest that thriving relationships need humility. Can we say humility? No more selfishness. Of course, we could say no more pride, but the truth is that pride will lead to selfishness. I know no more selfishness, no more selfishness is a really high ideal. It would mean the flesh is dead and buried forever, and it probably isn't reality. No more selfishness. But God can help us. Here's the truth, though, that in relationships, nothing creates an environment for love and blessing more than a heart of mutual service. Service. Humility that seeks to serve. That positions to love and bless and help and build up and encourage to lift up. As we've already read, Jesus put it like this, greater love has no one than this, than he would lay down his life for his friends. Of course, Jesus was about to do this in a unique way, but if our hearts will seek to lay down our lives for one another, thriving relationships can happen among us. Philippians 2, 3 to 7, the famous verses say, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, Value others above yourselves. Other translations say, consider others better than yourself. Not only looking to your own interests, but each to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. My brothers and sisters, If we would seek to live in humility, to serve one another, to love one another, to prefer one another. Romans 12 verse 10 says this, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another, preferring, esteeming, yielding to one another. The writer C.S. Lewis says, said humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. And if we seek to do that, to love and serve one another, we create this massive margin, not just you to me, but also me to you, this massive margin for grace and love and blessing to flow. Sometimes in marriages, it is the selflessness that gets eroded over time, the preferring of one another, and selfishness can begin to creep in, and resentment can then also creep in. And there can be a a coldness and a withdrawing and we give room for the enemy to worm his way into our relationships and bring discord and division, provoking pride and disappointment. And it's never what either party set out imagining could possibly happen. But if we reposition ourselves in humility, we will find there is room for restoration. We will remember afresh why we fell in love in the first place. And love can be rekindled there. Humility will give us grace with those maybe who need it most. In the little group that we began to lead, we went on an amazing adventure. I remember one young lady that joined the group. Uh, She was, how would I say, a little bit frosty. You didn't need a word of knowledge to know that she had an attitude problem. When she arrived, she was what you might call difficult. And I think previously, maybe I would have seen her, or judged her attitude, and, and maybe judged her, her for it, and maybe not loved her as I should. But we had set our stall that we were going to love people until their ice melted. And she stayed, and she kept coming back. We learned a great phrase in that season, that it's hard to hate someone whose pain you understand. And over time, we learned her story of pain and rejection and difficulty. 
And when I understood what she had been through, I was amazed how well she was doing. And in time, she gave her heart to the Lord. And something beautiful happened. Her, her frostiness went. Her heart opened up like a flower. She embraced not only the Lord, but the people. A work of grace was seen evidently in her life. She fell in love with the Bible. She came one of, became one of our leaders, and she ended up working for a church. And we saw what can happen when we humble ourselves, when we say, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to love you as best as I can by the power of the Holy Spirit. My friends, we need proximity, and secondly, we need humility. Thirdly, in thriving relationships, we need maturity. Can we say maturity? No more avoidance. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16, we read about the five-fold ministry gifts. But we also see the call to maturity. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all, can we say we all? Until we all reach unity in the faith. This is the goal, the heart of God, that we would be united in Christ Jesus and in the knowledge of the Son of God and that we would become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love. This is maturity. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. As each part does its work. You see this beautiful picture of the church, a mature and growing body. You can feel the maturity in this church in ICC Nairobi. This is a, you are a mature and maturing church. And mature churches change the world. But to grow and deepen in our maturity, we must love one another. We must strive for unity. And we must behave in relationships as Christ has shown us how to behave. Some of this we've just focused on humility, proximity. These are mature attributes in the body of Christ. But also, sometimes when things can become fractured or difficult, we need to be mature in outworking how God has shown us how to behave with one another. Because occasionally things can go wrong. A few years ago, we, we had our bathroom done in our house. And when I say we had our bathroom done, there was a guy came called Mark, and he ripped everything out, and he relayed the positioning of things. He did all the first fixing, and then he put all the installations in, and he did the tiling and the grouting and sealed it, and it looked fantastic. But then two months later, when we were in the kitchen, water started coming through from the bathroom above. And guess what I did? Yeah, I phoned the guy who built it. And he came straight out, and immediately he knew what to do. He knew how to fix it. Why? Because he was the one who made it. And sometimes things can become difficult in our relationships. And the one who made us knows how to fix it. And his ways work. I think that's what I want on my tombstone when I die. God's ways work. Because I'm trying to live in his ways. And... I can tell you, I've not tried to live out anything that he has said and found that it doesn't work. It works. But sometimes we need to behave in maturity because in our flesh we want to shrink back and do something that feels more comfortable. Now I understand sometimes we can get deeply hurt. Hurt that maybe needs help from others as well as help from the Holy Spirit. That can take time for trust to be rebuilt. I understand. But sometimes we can... Just bump into one another with a bit of difficulty and God has already shown us how to make things better, how to fix things. And this is maturity, no more avoidance. Matthew 18, 15, Jesus, who is so committed to us loving one another and outworking his command, he says this, if your brother or your sister sins, other versions say, if they wrong you or offend you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. You know, it's very dangerous to pass on an offense to someone else. 
I know this is completely unthinkable because you have such a godly pastor. But, but just, just for a moment, purely for illustration's sake, imagine this afternoon, which obviously won't happen and it's difficult to imagine, but imagine if Bishop Gibson said something unkind to me and I was a bit upset by it. And I found Pastor Mungai and I, and I said, Pastor Mungai, you'll never guess what Bishop Gibson said to me. It really upset me. I thought he was better than that. And a little bit later, Bishop Gibson comes and says, Martin, I'm really sorry. I was just a bit clumsy with my words. Will you forgive me? And of course, I will say, yes, of course, my brother. Thank you. I forgive you. And something beautiful happens here. This is the power of the grace of God at work. How some things, when they are fractured and come back together in the grace of the Holy Spirit, they can become stronger than they were before. There are some glues where if something breaks and you glue it back, it is a stronger join than it was before it broke. You won't find that in self-help books or win friends and influence people. But this is how God works. This is maturity. But if that happened, there is a problem. Because I have now passed on the offense. And now Pastor Mungai, Mungai has a bit of a problem with Bishop Gibson. But Bishop Gibson doesn't know that. That's not his fault. It's not Pastor Mungai's fault. It's my fault. But Jesus says, go. Just the two of you. Oh, it can be embarrassing. It can be difficult. Many times I've had to go to someone and say, I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? I didn't didn't live up in that interaction to the high standards of the Bible. Please forgive me. And something great can happen. The grace of God can come. Sometimes I have to go and simply say, are we okay? Because it felt like we were okay. And now it feels like maybe we're not okay. And normally if I ask someone if we're okay, normally something has happened where I've said something and I didn't even realize I said something. And then they say, what has happened? And I'm able to say, will you forgive me? And the relationship is restored. This is maturity. This is part of how we outwork the command to love one another. Sometimes I've even had to go and say, I'm sorry, I was hurt. When you said this, and I have been harboring unforgiveness in my heart, will you forgive me? And if that brother or sister is mature, they will say, of course. And will you also forgive me? I didn't realize that I had hurt you. We open the door to the grace of God, proximity, humility, maturity. We make room for the miracle in the mess of relationships. And you know, if we don't do this, heaven could be awkward Because we're all going to be there. Including the people we fell out with a little bit. Let's repair it down here. This is mature. History tells us that the Apostle John in his latter years was in the great church in Ephesus. The Apostle John. The one whom Jesus loved. The one who had been with Jesus. And they would bring him out in his latter years just to see if there was a story maybe he had never shared with them before. Maybe something of Jesus' teaching that he recalled and he would drive them mad because every time he would come out and he'd say, yes, yes, yes. Dear children, love one another. And they were like, you've told us that every month for years. And he'd say, yes. Dear children, love one another. The one who'd been with Jesus. This matters to God. Relationships matter to God. As I land this message right now in this little group that we began to to lead, the 30 quickly became 60, quickly became 120 because people want to be where the love of God is among his people. I remember after about a year, we'd broken into some small groups, but we came together once a month. And I remember an, an unforgettable evening, which was the epitome of what we experienced as we tried to build thriving relationships by the grace of the Holy Spirit. We had everyone in, and really the room where we met was not big enough for us. There were not enough seats for everyone, and, and I found myself sitting on the floor to the side. And we had a testimony night. We just made room for people to share what God had done in their lives. Remember the first young lady that got up, she, she said, I want to share with you here that many, a few years ago, I I had a serious eating disorder, and she named the disorder she had. She said, I was told by the doctors I would probably not be able to have children, and I want to testify that God has healed me, and I'm married, and not everyone in the group knew her well, but she had two children, and she testified, 
in the safety of brothers and sisters who loved her. And the place erupted and praised God and celebrated her. And then a young man got up and said, well, if she's shared that, I need to share this. And he shared the brokenness of his own life and the healing work of God in the presence of brothers and sisters. And the place erupted and praised God and celebrated him. And for an hour and a half, this went on as one person after another came and said, this is the mess of my life. And this is what God is doing and what God has done. And we rejoiced together. It was so beautiful. I, I remember thinking on that night, of some of the privileges of my life. Drinking coffee in Sydney Harbour, Australia. Standing next to the Niagara Falls in Canada. Looking up at the Sistine Chapel in Rome. I think now being here for us in Nairobi, Kenya. Seriously. But as I sat on the floor that night in that little room, I remember thinking, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. The church. Maybe... A little bit more like God saw before the creation of the world. But it requires us to love one another. This is a very simple message here today, ICC. But it matters deeply to God. Our relationships matter deeply to Him. Our love for one another. It will require proximity. It will require humility. And it will require maturity. But if we will commit ourselves to it, the grace of God will be found in us and through us. And it will become this attractive beacon to the world that cannot be stopped. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your profound example that greater love has no one than this than he laid down his life for his friends we thank you you laid down your life for us we pray would you help us help us spirit of the living god to better outwork however far we have come to go a little further in letting the command to love one another be evidenced in our lives father i pray if there is pain and brokenness right now that even this message just begins to poke at let the grace of God come would you show us what we need to do how we can step forward I pray God Almighty you would help us help this great world touching church to be a crucible of love and maturity where the grace of God is found and your name is glorified. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like more information about ICC Nairobi, you can follow us on all our social media platforms, that is Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at ICC underscore Nairobi or our website, iccnairobi.org. Be sure to subscribe and share this podcast with your family and friends. Until next time.